had a lot of uranium. We've got, so I got a book out called Poison Power by Goffman and Tamplin. Goffman worked for the AEC. And I read about plutonium. I nearly got alopecia totalis. As I was reading the book, like my hair fell out. I'd never read anything so dangerous. So let me walk you through it. It's an alpha emitter such that 10 to the 6 grams is definitely carcinogenic, a millionth of a gram, but it's probably 10 to the minus 9 grams. When they injected it into beagle dogs, they didn't find a dose low enough that didn't give every dog cancer. Right? It is an alpha, it's got a half-life of 24,400 years, so it's around, you know, a quarter to half a million years. It's all over Europe. Um, it's an iron analogue. It's not absorbed well from the gut, but in neonatal guts it's absorbed because they're immature and in chlorinated water it's absorbed better. But it is inhaled into the lung and of course it, it, it lands very down here and because the alpha particle travels only a very short distance um, and as radiation decreases with the square of the distance, most cells die within that volume but on the periphery cells remain viable and get mutated and that's why it's so carcinogenic. Now macrophages pick it up and take it to the mediastinal lymph glands where it can cause lymphoma, Hodgkin's and the like. It is stored in the liver of course where iron is stored where it can cause hepatocarcinoma. It goes to the bone of course where it can induce osteogenic sarcoma, polycythemia vera, uh, multiple myeloma and leukemia. Um, it crosses the placenta. Now the placenta lets very few things pass. But because it's an iron analogue, it gets into the developing embryo, which, like thalidomide, it's going to kill a cell that's going to form the left half of the brain or the right arm. And if you look at this book um, produced by the New York Academy of Sciences on Chernobyl, where they, they translated 5,000 articles from Russian into English, uh, there are homes full of the most grossly deformed children around Chernobyl that we have never seen before in the history of paediatrics. I'll pass it round for you to look at. This book also goes through all the deformities and deaths and premature aging and cataracts people get from radiation and heart disease and cancer. And already by now, over a million people have died from Chernobyl. And that's the first 25 years. This is a total cover-up. It's the biggest cover-up in the history of medicine that I've ever read about. Ch um, Fukushima is 2.5 to 3 times worse. So you multiply a million in 25 years by 3. Because we in medicine always look at the worst case possibility and work to prevent that, right? Um, these children, this is called teratogenesis. It's what thalidomide did. But there are homes full of children like this, and just pass it round, and you all must look at that. That's plutonium. The other thing is it's got a predilection for the testicle. And every male in the Northern Hemisphere has a tiny load of plutonium in his testicles from weapons testing days, and it tends to deposit just next to the spermatogonia in the testicle, irradiating the genes of the coming sperm. And so therefore, the genetic mutations are passed on generation to generation. Meanwhile, if the man is um, cremated, his smoke goes out the chimney. Anyway, don't get cremated. It adds to global warming. Get buried. It feeds the soil. Um, the plutonium goes out the chimney, so another man can inhale it and get into his testicle. And so you can see more than an exponential increase in genetic damage for the rest of time. And don't forget, we're not the only species with testicles. <laughs> and the, we inhabit the planet with 30 million other species, all of which um, can be damaged by radiation in the environment. Now, I, I, ha I quickly will do Fukushima. Um, Fukushima is a catastrophe beyond Chernobyl. There have been three meltdowns. They knew in the first two or three days that there were meltdowns, but they didn't tell the Japanese people for three months. Japan's a feudalistic society, and everyone, you know, can apologize, and the women are very, they speak in little tiny voices, but the women are get, starting to get really angry, and they're rising up. Um, the amount of radiation that got out is all estimates, guesstimates. There are no measurements. There were no radiation monitors active at the time, except some called C, I think they were called Sievitz 
or whatever, the something system, which measures radiation from fallout from weapons testing. And they actually knew where the radiation was going, but they didn't tell the people because they didn't want to cause panic. So the people ran exactly right into the area where the radiation was falling in the northwest. The first few days, the winds were blowing towards the east and blew over the Pacific. And that was lucky because if they'd blown over Japan, um, Tokyo would have had to be evacuated. As it is, about half of Japan is now contaminated. Um, the rice, half the rice grown in Japan grow, is grown in Fukushima Prefecture, and it's coming in with cesium-137 in it. Uh, there's a cesium-137 in the tea grown south of Tokyo. There are very, very hot spots in Tokyo, and when you watch Arnie Gunderson this afternoon, who I work very closely with, the nuclear engineer, he's just been in Tokyo, and he had his Geiger counter, and he just sort of put it down, the thing went mad. So there are hot spots all over Tokyo, which is a long way from Fukushima. I mean, I can't tell you what sort of catastrophe this is. And also, there were hydrogen explosions in the four reactors. Oh, well, I'll, I can show you this. Here are the reactors looking really nice and hygienic and terrific and painted blue and white. And this is what they looked like afterwards. See the abs building's absolutely shattered. Unit 3... Uh, didn't burst apart, Unit 4 did here. Well, that's a close-up. I mean, <laughs> what a catastrophe. And where did the hydrogen come from? As they lost the, the... See, they lost their external power supply from the earthquake. Each reactor needs a million gallons a minute circulating to keep it cool of water. So when they lost their pump, pumps, they've got diesel generators underneath the reactors and then in came the tsunami and absolutely destroyed the diesel generators, so they couldn't cool the reactors, so they melted down within 48, 24 to 48 hours. But as they melted, the zirconium on the cladding of the fuel rods reacted with the water to produce hydrogen, and the hydrogen collected in the containment of the building, and when you get hydrogen, it's like the Hindenburg. It exploded and totally, totally destroyed. Just look, look at this. And Unit 4, there was an explosion in the cooling pool. I think Unit 2, the cooling pool, had an atomic excursion, in other words, an atomic explosion, and plutonium is being found miles and miles away from the reactor because it came from the spent fuel rods in the cooling pool. It had an atomic excursion. Australian Radiation Service, so for the first three days, here it is, and then six days getting over to you. This is where you are here and 10 days you're enveloped in a cloud of radioactive fallout. And it was very hot, very high. And again, you can see the 18th of March, it's just hitting you. Uh, 21st of March is still hitting you, but it's passed all the way over to Boston, and they found radioactive fallout in Oklahoma and all over America. Well, there it is. And then on the 24th of March, it's actually starting to circle the whole of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, well, this is just an indication of where the fallout went when the wind changed from blowing east uh, to the northwest, and this is where the people fled. And children are still living in areas which were evacuated around Chernobyl. The Japanese government has been really obscene in looking after its children. Next. Next. Well, these are just some of the elements, uranium-238 and 235, 234, all of which are very carcinogenic, causing congenital deformities and cancer in children in Fallujah and Basra, where they're using uranium weapons. It's really a nuclear war. Here's plutonium, cesium-137, strontium. Cobalt-60 is nasty gear too, really nasty, and its half-life is five years more. We've done this more. And this is interesting. This is uh, ginkgos made in hair fern trees just after. This is July the 30th. And it's sort of spring, you know, early summer. And these dead areas on the leaves are where radioactive fallout landed and killed the leaves. These are the azaleas that are all dead. Now, extrapolate that to lungs. Okay? Um, Arnie worked with a man called Mark Kaltofen, and you can find this on Arnie's website or my website too. And they took um, engine filters from cars in Tokyo and measured the radiation in them. 
And the filters were so radioactive, they were brought to America, they had to be buried in radioactive waste dumps. Now, an engine filter is the same as a lung, and it inhales almost about the same amount of air per day as does a lung. They found 10 hot spots in lungs in people in Tokyo, hot spots, plutonium. They measured them here in Seattle, five per day. Yeah. And the thing that's so sad is you see no cancer when it arises, when you cough up your first bit of blood and you think, oh shit, you know, better go to the doctor and the x-ray's taken and there's a mass. doesn't wear a, a sign denoting its origin. doesn't say I was made by some plutonium you hailed from Fukushima 10 years ago. So we can't identify the etiology of a particular cancer. All we can do is take a an exposed population, which we did with Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Marshall Islands and the like, and compare them to a non-exposed group. Do you want to take some questions? Yeah. So the cloud that you showed in the dispersion path, yeah. are, we get, are we still okay. getting that on a regular basis? Not, not very much at all, although Arnie says it's still emitting a million curies a day, I think. We need to ask him. A lot's still getting out. However, if there's another earthquake and building four collapses, which contains the cooling pool with fresh fuel, I'm going to evacuate my family from Boston. And they will have to evacuate Tokyo. You go where? Where, where are you going to go? Australia, love. <laughs> <laughs> See, the two air masses don't mix at the equator, so the northern hemisphere just gets the fallout. And if there's another earthquake, Oh, that's if there's enough. But also now the corium, which is the molten lava of the meltdowns, is on the concrete floor and it can react with the concrete to form hydrogen. In fact, it's doing it that as we speak and they're injecting nitrogen at great rate into the three reactors, unit one, two, and three, to remove the hydrogen so it won't explode. The other thing Arnie explained to me is you get radiolytic decomposition of water so the radiation splits the water atom into hydrogen and oxygen, a very volatile explosive compound. So we're still at great risk. The accident is not over. There's no way to clean it up. They say 40 years, but they can't clean it up. They can't. Um, and God help us. We don't, I mean, it's not over. This is a, a study I commissioned called Carbon Free Nuclear Free. There's enough wind power west of the Mississippi to supply your whole country with three times the electricity you currently use. You waste 28% of the electricity you use, nuclear power generates 20%. Turn off all your lights, your computers, don't hang your clothes, don't dry your clothes in clothes dryers, hang them outside in the sun. Oh, but Mrs. Brown might, <laughs> Mrs. Brown might see your underpants and your brassiers. Oh, and in the winter, hang them up by the furnace. I mean, just be sensible. Don't walk through those doors that open and close. They're global warming doors. Okay, here's your country. And this was just done by the Natural Resources Defence Council. These are all the reactors you've got. Um, and that's only a 10-mile exclusion zone surrounding them. But in uh, Japan, the American military demanded that the American citizens have to evacuate 50 miles from Fukushima. But of course, it wasn't enough. So I just wanted to, to give you an image of what you're dealing with and from a medical perspective, or I would say it's medically, contra, it's medically indicated to close all of those reactors down tomorrow. And I don't care what laws they've got or what the NRC says. Laws are not written in stone and we are the bosses. We are the bosses, the physicians. We understand and we, only we have the authority and credibility to close these carcinogenic factories down which will over time from radioactive waste produce random compulsory genetic engineering for the rest of time. Okay, thanks. Thank you.